The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar. The Enfield Poltergeist is the name given to the claims of poltergeist activity at a council house in Enfield, England from 1977 to 1979 involving two sisters, Janet Hudson, age 11, and her sister Margaret, age 13. Members of the Society for Psychical Research, Morris Gross and freelance writer Guy Lyon Playfair believe this to be a genuine case of poltergeist activity and Guy is here today to tell us about his experience of the Enfield haunting. So firstly Guy, could you tell us what a poltergeist is? Um, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's a word we use for something we don't understand. It's actually um, what they call a syndrome. You know, a concurrence of symptoms, meaning a lot of things have happened together. And we just call them poltergeist because um, in the 500 years since Martin Luther introduced the word, nobody's come up with a better one, which is a bit strange, but it's, um, it's almost exactly 500 years since the word first appeared in print, although it was probably used before print. But um, Martin Luther was always banging on about poltergeists and he also called them rumplegeist, which is rather a nice word. Perhaps we should use that in rumble ghost. Sounds good in English. But it's, um, it's yeah, 500 years. It was about 15 or 20 that he wrote one of his innumerable pamphlets about something or other. I'm sure not very popular in, in Ireland, but um, he, he did have um, a lot to say about poltergeists. And for him, of course, they were simply evil spirits. But uh, simple, simplified, and I don't, yeah. I don't agree. I think he's wrong. Um, they're not evil spirits at all. Well, then, how how did you first come to be involved in the Enfield case, and what was the family experiencing at the time? Well, it was uh, a series of weird coincidences that got me involved because I was um, uh, planning to go on holiday after spending two years writing a very long and difficult book, mm-hmm. which I was glad to get rid of. And um, I'd actually been waiting for a bus that afternoon to take me to the um, Romanian embassy to get a visa and as was quite common in those days the bus didn't come Mm -hmm. so I thought to hell with that I'll go tomorrow and then in the evening I went to um, the Society for Psychical Research lecture which happened to be on poltergeist. I sat in front of a fellow I'd only met once called Maurice Gross who was a new member and we just exchanged sort of greetings and I, I didn't know him at all well. Anyway, at the end of the talk, uh, Morris leapt to his feet and said he was studying a very interesting case in North London right now, Mm -hmm. and he'd appreciate some help. I did not offer to help. I I wanted to go on holiday. Mm -hmm. So I I couldn't very well escape because I was sitting right next to him, right in front of him, right in front. I turned around and said, let me know if you get really stuck and I'll see what I can do, but I'm going away next week. Somehow I never made it to the Romanian embassy on the Friday. And on Sunday morning, I heard Morris on BBC News at lunchtime. He got it onto the news program. The reporter, Rosalind Morris, had stayed up all night at the house and recorded some pretty interesting noises and um, got into the studio, uh, still awake, and done a very competent and interesting piece on the case. So I thought, well, hang on, the holiday have to wait. This is this is a good one. And I'm not just going to walk out on a, on a really interesting sounding case. Yeah. Not too far away from where I live. I mean, it's, it's on the underground, so I get there in about 40 minutes. And I called up Morris and said, well, I'll pop in this evening, just sort of see what I can do. And um, I stayed for on and off for 14 months. So um, that's how it began. Well, what was it that convinced you this was a genuine case? Oh, straight off. I mean, f- um, first of all, the atmosphere in the house, they were all scared out of their wits. I mean, they were absolutely terrified. And how do you fake that? And why would you fake that? And they wouldn't even go, go into the toilet on their own. The girls had to go both together, you know, and they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't go to the kitchen to, to make me a cup of tea on their own. They, they had to have somebody with them. Uh, they slept with the light on all night, for several months, they really were scared. And, and, and after um, after they got into bed, when, when things tended to be rather worse, you could tell that they were absolutely terrified. 
Uh, luckily, Maurice had a very, very, uh, very good way with with children. He had two of his own. He was very good at calming them down and telling them that it had happened before to other people. And it was known as a poltergeist. It was a word they'd never heard. In fact, Janet immediately called it a polka dice, which, uh, which is how I always remember it, the Enfield polka dice. And um, they gradually sort of got used to it. And um, Morris did a really superb job of, of social welfare. I mean, he, he stopped them being terrified and got them interested. And that's not easy. I mean, not many people can do that because there, there are very few people who have a faintest idea of what, what happens on a, on a Poltergeist case, which luckily he did because he'd read quite a lot. And I'd already been on several other cases in when I lived in Brazil, where they were pretty common. And so um, the family was pretty lucky. They, they had two um, uh, fairly well-educated in matters of poltergeist yeah. um, investigators to help them out, and uh, I think we did. And, and I believe a policewoman even signed a police report saying she'd witnessed a chair move yeah. by itself. On the first day, yes, that's right. They, they, um, there was such an atmosphere of panic on the first night that they, they called the police, or rather the neighbours did, the other half of the semi detached house. They, they, they heard all the commotion and came in to see what they could do. And they called the police, and um, two of them turned up, including a, a young woman who I think had only just joined the force. She was very young, in her early 20s. She gave us a written, signed statement a couple of days later to say that she'd seen a chair sliding along the floor in front of her eyes with nobody anywhere near it. And um, I later saw exactly the same thing myself. I thought, well, there aren't many poltergeist cases where you get evidence from the police on the first yeah. day. It's a good start. Well, then, could you tell me about the voice that came from Janet? Oh, I could indeed. That was much later, and it's quite a long story. I, I was tempted to say read the book, but I'm sure you will or you have. So, so um, we actually asked for it because, because what happened was we started to hear strange kind of whistling noises, quite loud. And since the girls have never been heard to whistle before, and Janice had quite a serious um, tooth problem in those days. She needed her teeth straightening, which she's, mm -hmm. so, so she's had since, and that now speaks quite normally. But when she was 11, she, she, she had a, a, very, um, a very sort of distorted palate, and she couldn't whistle. She couldn't sort of uh, get her lips into the right shape, you know, so she couldn't do it. And here were these whistles, and then Maurice Gross, who was a very down-to-earth fellow, he, he was a... Uh, electrical engineer and inventor, you know, he didn't have much time for ghosts and spirits and things. Yeah. He saw we had a problem here, so he, he set about trying to solve it. And he, he said, um, okay, if you can whistle and grunt, we were getting grunts as well. Why don't, why don't you talk? So go on, say my name, gross. And quite after two or three attempts, we had this extraordinary gross, which um, really startled me. I mean, it was very loud. And it was absolutely uh, like an old man. It was not a 11-year-old girl's voice. And um, I happened to have a niece at uh, uh, the same age. And I played her a tape recording. And I said, can you do that? And she could. But she said, ow, oh, that, that really gave me, gave me a hurt to the throat. Yeah, I could imagine. Because it does. I mean, you try it. It's, it's very, very uh, yeah. hard on the larynx. So, and Janet could keep it up for hours. I mean, she, she could just go on and on and on. And sometimes very, very loud. I mean, really sort of shouting, extraordinary noise. We had a speech therapist who, who um, we managed to persuade to come and listen. And she got totally freaked out and left very early and refused to talk about it afterwards. And she, all she would say was that she'd never heard anything like it. I rather gathered that she hoped she never would again. Uh, we also um, got hold of the professor of phonetics at Birkbeck College, London University, who very kindly lent us a thing called a laryngograph, which is a couple of metal plates that you clamp onto the neck, and um, that records the signals of, of your vocal apparatus. And he established that the voice was not made by Janet's normal vocal cords. It was made yeah. by the false vocal cords, or if you want it in the original, the plica ventricularis, which is what um, actors of commercials use for making those sort of noises. Yeah. And they can't keep it up for very long. They, they get a sore throat as well. They, they don't do it more than they have to because it's, it's very painful. 
Uh, in fact, we have Maurice Scrooge offered a, a reward of five hundred pounds to anybody, any of these sort of rents of skeptic people who turn up and, and know the answers to everything. He said, "Okay, bring along your eleven-year-olds and keep that up for, for I think half an hour, normal conversation, and I'll give you five hundred quid." And nobody took it up. One famous skeptic. Uh, Susan Blackmore, who had a daughter conveniently of the same age, she said casually, oh yes, my daughter can do that. So we said, okay, bring her on and we'll give you 500 quid. And she, we never heard from her again. Speaking of the sceptics there, something they all kept talking about in any documentary you watch about this is that the girls had apparently admitted 2% fakery in various instances. So why do you think they felt the need to play pranks when all this activity was going on? Well, if you know 11-year-old girls who don't play pranks, <laughs> you're lucky because they do. And um, they'd be rather sort of unnatural if they didn't. And they, um, it's also, I think, you don't have to be a professional child psychologist to know that children learn practically everything they know by imitation. So if they've got a poltergeist rampaging around the house, they're going to start imitating it. That is absolutely natural. And I thought it was a sign, that very encouraging sign, that life was getting back to normal because they certainly didn't do anything like that to start with. And um, also, I must say, they were totally, they were no good at it. They were absolute failures as fakes, <laughs> um, as they've freely admitted ever since. Um, the first thing they did was they, when I went out to the pub for, for my um, evening meal, because I never let them uh, feed me in, in the house, they decided to hide my tape recorder in somewhere. And um, when I got back, they said the ghost had taken it away. So I thought, oh, yes, and I found it in about two minutes, and it was still recording. Oh, dear. So they recorded all the evidence. Of what themselves. they did, yeah. And I, all I did was just play it back, and I didn't say anything. Well, I think I just said, no, nice try. <laughs> yeah. And we forgot yeah. about it, and they didn't do it again. So, I mean, what? It's no big deal at all. It didn't bother me, it didn't bother them. And um, I did ask them not to play around with my tape recorder because they were very expensive in the 1970s. They, they cost a lot more than they do today, relatively. I, I, I didn't, it did, the, the recorder later on did fly across the room on its own, which didn't do any good, but that was not the girls, that was, that was something else. But th that was the first time they decided to play a trick, and um, they did very few more. They, 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 um, we found a chair balanced on the wardrobe door very precariously, quite cleverly, and then um, once we got that down and sorted, it happened again. This time, not, not quite so um, exactly, and I thought that was a bit suspicious, and, and um, Janet admitted that they had done that one. So I took the attitude of... Sort of, look, we've got enough real stuff happening, there's no need to add to it. And they they, they stopped it. I mean, they, they when, when the book appeared and we had all sorts of radio plugs and things, uh, they were asked over and over again if you played any tricks. And uh, Janet always answered almost in the same words, oh yes, once or twice, just to see if Mr. Gross and Mr. Playfair would catch us. And they always did. Right. Unfortunately for these sceptics, we got it on tape. And I've got practically everything on tape, and all of these remarks are still available in the, um, hopefully, in the BBC and Channel 4 ITN archive, where she got onto the news uh, three times, including the World Service and also the French radio, saying the same thing. So it's on the record. I mean, it, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no doubt what she said. She said, we did play tricks once or twice just to see if they would catch us, and they always did. Well... The Conjuring Part 2 has been released this summer and it's based on the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren and the Enfield haunting. But what oh. involvement exactly did the Warrens have in the case? Oh dear, the Warrens, yes. Well, um, not much is all I can say. I only met, um, I met them once, very briefly. All I can remember is Ed Warren telling me that he could make a lot of money for me. And I thought, well, I won't repeat what I thought. And that, that was... But it looked to me like a fake researcher, and I just wanted to get away from him as soon as I could, which I, which I did. And I never saw him again. Um, I'm not aware that he did anything of any value at all. So basically, you know? were the Warrens there for like a day, a week? Did they have much time in the house at all? No, uh, I, think, I think at the most two or three days, possibly. 
remember that. But I, I really don't know because I wasn't there. I mean, I, I, um, th- this um, they were there quite late in, in uh, 1978 when the case of Two World died down. There wasn't very much happening, just occasional outbursts of movements and things, but nothing particularly un- unusual. All, all, all the really heavy stuff had taken place in the first three months between um, September and... Well, uh, four months, September, December, 77. That, that was the the most active period. And after then, it sort of slowly faded off. I think by the time the Warrens turned out, there was really very little happening at all. So basically, <clears throat> when this movie comes out, it's going to be a very fictionalised version of the Enfield haunting. Uh, I would imagine so, yes. And um, I, I've had absolutely nothing to do with it. They, they never consulted me. They didn't, mm-hmm. didn't have to. I mean, they're dealing with uh, information in the public domain, and if they use any of my book, they're going to be in trouble, uh, and they know that, <laughs> because Morris Gross's son is a pretty hotshot lawyer from a large company in London, and he's um, not going to let them get away with any any sort of uh, plagiarism. So um, they can do what they like, and, and if it sells a few more books, fine. I mean, the, the um, channel, what was it, that... Um, Sky television. Yes, serial. that's going to ask you. There was a three part Sky TV show called The Enfield Haunting. That was based on your book, was it? Uh, that was, yes. And that was um, with my uh, cooperation to start with. Although, if I'd known how it was going to turn out, I would have run away screaming because it had nothing to do with the, the book at all. Um, I mean, it apart from the opening and Maurice Gross's Jaguar, which was absolutely authentic, that, that was good but everything else was, was pure fiction so the the whole the whole thing that was in that that it was morris keeping the poltergeist there because his had his daughter died was that true or was that made uh, up well that was true yes and um there were various sort of again strange coincidences the fact that his daughter was called janet mm-hmm. and janet was called janet and they were about Janet Hodgson was a bit older, but um, Morris was pretty down to earth. So he never got carried away by, by sort of supernatural fantasies. He was a very practical fellow. I mean, he, he was, a, as I say, he was a mechanical engineer. where I mean, well, you have to get things right. He was also quite quite a philosophical fellow. He was interested in the mysteries of life, and um, he, he was quite... Um, quite, quite religious. He, he was a warden of his local synagogue and uh, took took his religion very seriously, but not not sort of uh, aggressively so. Mm-hmm. He, he was a thoroughly uh, honourable, worthy man altogether. Well, one of the one of the finest people I've known, and um, completely um, dedicated to helping the the two girls and, and all that nonsense about his wife having an affair with a medium. So that's a total rubbish, and it just didn't happen. Period. Was Janet's personality portrayed well, do you think? Well, <laughs> with all respect to dear Janet, I mean, she's not quite such a beauty as Eleanor, what's her name, who is obviously a, a very fine actress to come, mm-hmm. and she's already won several prizes, um, including an Olivier Award for Best uh, Theatre, in, um, I've forgotten the name of. But, um, no, she didn't really um, look very much like Janet. The, the, the elder sister, Margaret, did. Mm-hmm. She was very well cast. She, she was um, very, very similar. And Timothy Spall was quite uncannily like Morris. When he came to see me, I, I almost thought it was him. You know, yeah. he, He'd studied a lot of um, videos, clips that, that Morris had made. And he's a terrific actor and could do absolutely anything. You know, He'd just done... Uh, Turner, painter, it couldn't be more different from a, a ghost investigator. But he he was he was absolutely superb, and he, he um, we had a nice chat, and I, I told him um, sort of investigators of poltergeists are pretty normal people, I hope. And um, my, my my approach to the thing was very much as I always had a, as a freelance, originally journalist. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd worked on the local paper and in Rio de Janeiro, which is the traditional way to start, as you as you know, covering plane crashes and political scandals and all that sort of thing, which Brazil has got plenty of both. So um, 
my attitude was go and see what's happening and write it down. I mean, that's as <laughs> simple as that, and that's what I did at Enfield. Well, there was one part of the, of the TV programme I wanted to ask you if it was true. There was a scene where, um, I don't know, it was the two other investigate, paranormal investigators were there and they weren't believing the voice coming from Janet. And Morris put water in her mouth and then taped over her mouth and the voice still came out. Did that happen? Yes, that, that, that did happen. Um, and not only that, but it was... Um it wasn't actually water, it was, um, well, it was water that had been stained with some kind of um, dye, sort of what was blue. And um, the idea was that when she spat it out at the end, you could tell that she hadn't swallowed it, which she hadn't. So, yes, that was true. But one or two of the minor incidents were true, I should say, but all, all the major stuff was, was complete fiction. Uh, when, when I pointed this out to the producer, I got the classic uh, reply that, Oh, well, if we'd shown the real stuff, nobody would believe it. And I thought, well, what's, what's the point in making a film at all? And then uh, advertising it as based on a real case. If it's not. And then not, not showing what the real case was. I mean, that's sort of television mentality. It has to look good. Whether it's true or not is, is a trivial detail. One or two documentaries have done, done it very well on um, television, but uh, others, uh, all, all of the Sky uh, serial was very well made and excellent direction and production and all that, that but it was just simply not not the same as the same as my book well it really is a fascinating story and i can imagine it was very traumatic for janet how is she today what what scars has this left on her it has affected her um, of course it's difficult to tell because um I haven't seen a lot of her i haven't seen her for um, a couple of years now but we we met in a TV studio had quite a nice talk. She was very different from what she was as a teenager. I mean, she, she was very lively and bouncy as as, um, as a 12-year-old, but she's now very quiet and, and rather withdrawn. Frequently, she's asked me if it's likely to come back, and I've, I've used every trick I know to persuade her that it won't, because if they don't, they don't come back. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've told her more than once that if it did come back, it would be a world first and you'd be famous again. So she doesn't want to be famous again, so it hasn't come back. Uh, and um, yes, it did It did have a, a big, big impact on her and, and more than I realized at the time because she, she was always very um, extremely extrovert as, as, a, as a child. She was good at, very good at sports and jumping around and she was quite big for her age as well and very athletic and also rather hyperactive always rushing around and uh, chattering away and so on but not, uh, today she's absolutely different very very reserved and very devoted to her her sons she's got two boys and um, a very supportive husband who keeps keeps everybody away from her she absolutely does not want to be a celebrity which she certainly yeah. could be she turned down a huge offer which I actually arranged an um, interview with a well-known tabloid, and she just didn't, didn't answer. I, I can produce testimony from the writer. I'm not actually sure if it was the Sun or the Daily Mail, because he worked both. Um, I think it was the Sun. They offered her £800 for an interview, and she turned it down. And uh, they're not well-off family. They're, they're comfortable, but they're not rich. And she is not in it for the money, and never has been. And we've never paid her anything. We we did we did um, during the case we did ext manage to extort some fees from the TV people who turned up while it was going on because um, back in the 70s and 80s they had a lot more money to throw around. And Morris took the attitude what that um, Janet was supplying material to them, so they could damn well pay for it. And 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 uh, he was very really good at getting out of them. But we never, we never made anything for ourselves at all, nothing. And how about yourself at the moment? Have you any projects you're working on at the moment that you'd like to share with listeners? Well, yes. And, um, and I haven't been near a poltergeist for <laughs> 30 years, and I hope I never do again. I mean, one's enough, you know. I'd done quite a lot of them in, when I lived in Brazil, about five or six there, and they are very exhausting. You, you never know what's going to happen next. You just can't relax at all, and it does wear you down. No, for about the last 20 years, I've been studying twins, which is very much more peaceful 
they can be quite lively, but the, the way that they communicate with each other, which is very interesting, and nobody's ever done it, which, which I find quite astonishing. I'd say it's quite uh, fascinating. Well, I mean, you, you keep reading in the paper uh, stories about twins picking up uh, messages that the other one's had an accident or something. Yeah. It's always it's always reported as if it was the first time it had ever happened. Well, the earliest report, report that I've got is from 1790. It's, it's the same old story. You know, we've had poltergeist reports since 1520, and we've had twin um, telepathy reports at least since 1790, which was John Wesley, no less, the founder of the Methodist Church. So you'd think that uh, scientists would wake up and think there's something going on here, but they don't. And they say, oh, well, it's just coincidence, and poltergeists are always naughty little girls playing tricks, although they don't know... Mm -hmm how they do them. There are reasons for this. I mean, it's, it's all based on fear. You know, fear people are afraid of confronting reality. They really are. Um, I mean, I've, se I've seen this happen. Where people turn up and, um, well, the Enfield case was active. We had one or two psychologists who would heard all about it, and they sort of came in and rather expected us to lay on a display of table tilting on demand. And um, when a few kind of minor noises and creaks and things happened, they, they, they were scared out of their wits. I mean, they just <laughs> got out as soon as they could. Uh, it's all very acceptable as fiction, you see. People love all these horror films and so on, but when, when somebody like me comes along and says, well, actually, this, this, this does happen, uh, then a whole different attitude comes into to work. I mean, the, the assumption is that I must be crazy. Well... <laughs> Maybe I am, but nobody ever accused me of being crazy when I worked for The Economist or Time Magazine or Associated Press or mm. McGraw Hill Business News and so on. I could go on for some time. Well, do you have a website or anything like that where people can follow your work? No, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of low-profile individual. I don't like advertising myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very happy to talk to you because you, well, you don't, it's nice to talk to somebody who's really done the research properly and mm -hmm. um, gives me a chance to um, present the case without distortions. That's very much appreciated, but no, I, d I don't need to advertise, I'm glad to say, because I've done pretty, quite well for myself one way or the other, and I've done 12 books and um, hundreds of articles and interviews and things, and I've also done consultant work for, for um, a lot of um, TV programs, which is usually complete rubbish, but they pay very well, and there's no harm in that. But I, I don't let it get in the way of my serious work, which mm -hmm. I keep serious. The twin research is going quite well. We've finally, for the first time ever, managed to get cooperation of a major university department. Uh, London University's got the largest register in the world, 11,000 twins on the books. And um, my colleague, Adrian Parker, from professor of psychology at Gothenburg University, he, he's got access as a visiting scientist. So they're being, they're being very helpful, and, and this has never happened before, because um, the subject of twin telepathy has always been kind of taboo. Yeah, and it's a very interesting topic. It, it is, and I, I, I mean, it's, um, uh, it, it's something that, um, as I say, it's, it's never been done before um, properly. It's been mentioned, certainly, but... Nobody has actually tested for it, which, which um, preliminary testing, which didn't really lead anywhere. But we have at last tried to identify the reasons why some twins are telepathic and some aren't, because a great many of them are not. And um, this doesn't seem to make sense. If they're identical, they should all be the same. Well, the, some identical twins are a lot more identical than others, as um, George Orwell might have put it. Um, that that is absolutely true, and as uh, far as I know, we are the first to try and work out why how this could be. And I think it looks as though it's got something to do with exactly when they divide. You see, when a twin egg is fertilised, it, it splits. If it's going to split, it'll split within 12 days, or else you've got Siamese twins conjoined. Yeah. And uh, if the egg splits very early on. You get individually wrapped in your own little plastic bag, um, a neotic sack, and if it splits much later, you don't. You'd be in the same sack then. Well, it's not even sack. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's the unfortunate mother um, 
has to put up with these two things slushing around her belly and, and literally entangled with each other. And when they're born, they have to be pulled apart, literally. So, so talk about entanglement. I mean, that, that, and, and it, it's, um, it's, it's a very delicate business. That's why so many twins used to die, uh, die, be born dead until relatively recently. It's, it's a terrible ordeal having twins for the unfortunate mother. I mean, mm. it's um, until about the middle of the 19th century, it was quite unusual for both the twins to survive. And it was not unknown for both of them to die, and also the poor mother. So we've come a long way. I mean, the, we really have. You, you very rarely get, get deaths, twin deaths at birth now, and, and the mothers seem to be doing very well. I've met lots of them, and uh, they're all doing fine. And they... they um, they have now the, the, this ultrasonic scan uh, where you can tell exactly when the when the zygote divides so you know exactly um, what day it took place and if it's a very late uh, splitting uh, I, I, I can predict that they will develop a, a telepathic bond and if it's an early split they won't it's amazing how they can tell when the split was oh it's astonishing I know mm. I mean, I, I've, I've watched a um, ultrasonic scan on, on myself and it's really quite uh, it's quite unsettling when you think all that sort of mess on the screen that's me yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I have I have seen film of, of twin um, zygotes actually splitting it's fascinating I mean they, they, it's very recent as well I mean it's, uh, it's only been possible for, for anybody to, to go and watch uh, um, for a pregnant mother to keep an eye on her, mm-hmm. her twins I'm not sure exactly when it became available on the National Health Service, but it's, it's um, certainly from the second half of the 20th century, I would say. I mean, um, I can imagine if we'd had it earlier, I mean, it, it would have helped enormously. Yeah. It is certainly a fascinating subject, and I really wish the best of luck with all your research with it. And I want to thank you so much again, Guy, for coming on the show today, because I really want to hear your experience of the Enfield haunting. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you. The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Leisure Point Castle Bar.